Welcome all to our webinar organized by the Youth Disability Advocacy and Research Network. I'm Kathleen Brilla, Principal Lecturer in Film and TV at Bomas University. And for those who can't see me, I'm a 44-year-old white male wearing glasses and a white top, and I'm sitting in my home office. Actually, tomorrow I'll be 45. Oh, dear. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I have Happy birthday. Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a mm. lot, Coach. I almost forgot about it. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce a very special guest today who has done pioneering research in advertising and disability activism, Dr. Ella Houston. Uh, she's senior lecturer in disability studies at Liverpool Hope University, core member of the Center for Culture and Disability Studies and a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. She leads the courses, special educational needs and disability studies and researching the representation of disability in popular culture. She also manages work placement for students and she chairs the Learning, Teaching and Assessment Enhancement Subcommittee in the School of Sciences. She co-leads the university's academic literacy community of practice and her research is overall based in cultural disability studies and explores representations of disability in advertising. Before we start, can I please make sure that you keep yourself muted during the presentation and then Ella will announce when people can use sound to interact. There will be several opportunities to interact with sound, but in the meantime, feel free to use the chat at any time for questions or comments and we'll try to address these uh, at the end. So I'm now handing over to Ella. Thank you very much for being here. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Catalin, for a great introduction. And thank you, Catalin, Dan and Filippo. I'm not sure if Filippo's here or not, um, for inviting me to deliver this workshop. Uh, I've been really looking forward to it. And um, as I mentioned just previously, we had a CCDS, Centre for Culture and Disability Studies event at Hope yesterday. So I feel very lucky that I've um, been able to take part in two great events over the space of two days consecutively. So it's it's great to have you all here. Um, as I'm going along, if at any point my pace is quite fast or um, you know my speech isn't very clear, do feel free to flag that up. Um, how is my pace right now for everybody? Do you want me to slow down a little bit? Uh, is the volume okay? Uh, I've got two, th three, four, five. Okay, five thumbs up. If that changes, just let me know. So in order to begin, I'm going to share my slides with you. Hopefully on your screens should be um, my slides. Okay. Let me move your, I've got a bar with everyone's faces on, just let me move that slightly. Okay, so can I have your attention? Both halves of this slide communicate messages about disabled women's inclusion in the fashion industry. On my left side is an excerpt from an online article written by Sarah Kim for the World Institute on Disability. Titled Beauty and Disability, this article discusses how the fashion industry is slowly starting to recognize disabled models. So the article begins by stating, in quotes, the beauty and fashion industries have long fallen short of diversity and inclusion. But in the era of social media activism, the status quo has started to shift. More and more beauty brands are being inclusive of more body shapes, sizes and colors. But what continues to be left out is disability representation. And then the second paragraph in this article goes on to suggest that although the fashion industry is finally starting to rectify its exclusion of disability, it has a long way to go. So I've just described um, the text excerpt on my left side of the slide. Now I'm going to describe what's on the right side of my slide. So the right side displays a print advertisement for the high profile fashion brand Diesel. 
The advertisement, which has a bright pink background, depicts a group of models who ooze confidence. They look like they're having the time of their lives, like it's someone's taken a quick picture of them at a party, having fun somewhere. This group of models includes Winnie Harlow, a Jamaican Canadian supermodel who has vitiligo. Vitiligo is a skin condition that makes patches of a person's skin lose pigment or colour. Harlow playfully hugs another member of the group, so she has her arm around somebody who's got their arms up in the air while pointing one of her heels in the air. So Harlow, Harlow and the rest of the group, they're all wearing black clothes, um, leather jackets, or in Harlow's case, a, um, a leather bikini top. And um, the fact that she has vitiligo is apparent, um, so you can see her, her skin, it's not covered up. So to bring us to a discussion prompt, and this is where if anyone has any responses, if you want to put your mics off or you want to share your responses in the chat, I'd be really grateful. My question to you is, which half of my slide, so you have the text excerpt or you have the print advertisement, I'd like to ask you which half captures your attention the most and why? And also, can you consider whether the messages, meanings, and feelings that you interpret from both halves of the slides, are they similar or different? So in other words, when you're thinking about both sides of the slide, they're both communicating messages about disability, inclusion, and fashion. Which half, so either the article or the print ad, which half captures your attention the most? Um, how how do they communicate different messages to you? Do you take any meanings from one that you don't take from the other and vice versa? So I'd like to leave a few minutes now for some discussion. Um, Dan Filippo, I can't see everybody's, um, everyone's like thumbnail images. So if anyone's got their hand up or if, if thumbs up, if you'd be able to point that out, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yes, we'll do. Thank you. Feel free anyone to unmute yourself and or use the chat. <clears throat> we have from Francis a hand up. Yeah. Francis. Yeah, Francis, whenever you are ready. Can you hear us, Francis? No, not anymore. Yeah, Francis, your hand is up. Would you like to use the chat instead? Is it easier? See a message on the chat. Oh, so Shamim says the print on the right is more captivating because Winnie Harlow's disability is very visible. Um, the messaging, and then I can't see the rest of the message. Okay, but that's a good point. Um, so, so it's it's visually quite captivating that Harlow is a disabled woman. Thank you, Shamim. I, I I would say a couple of things about it. I okay. Think the impairment looks like it's part of the design. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's a good thing, but I think that's quite interesting, particularly the, uh, the midriff uh, right up to it. So you can't see it without having some serious thought to it, which I think 
kind of weakens the impact of it really. Uh, right, okay. Thank uh, you very much, Paul. And, and equally, she she is very thin and conventionally attractive as well. So yes, <laughs> that's not particularly challenging. Yeah, yeah, no surprises there. So Francis has um, just put a message to say he's joined. Thank you, Francis. Okay, so if I can. Um, carry on then and pick up on some of those points. Oh, Dan, do you have your hand up? Oh, sorry, yeah. No, I was just I was just gonna say to, to me when I was, when, to answer your, thinking about your question, the, just the sense of time really, what, like one of them is just a moment in time, this advert, there's, there's, you know, it's almost no concept of, of when it is, but the other one is explicitly kind of talking about changes over time if that makes sense mm -hmm. uh, you know we've we've long fallen short of diversity inclusion but this might be changing and so on they're slowly implementing more disability inclusive presence so yeah whereas one is just like a, a episodic you know, snapshot the other one seems to be making some yeah some broader observations about this yeah form. that's an interesting point um ad advertisements i mean the very nature of advertising they they do tend to focus on episodic um content and there are you know um benefits and limitations to that thank you okay so despite not including any explanations or direct messages about disability fashion and inclusion diesel's advertisement i would argue is most likely to capture people's attention, instantaneously signaling the growing integration of disabled models in fashion. Almost all of the models stare directly at the camera lens, reeling the audience in by establishing a personal connection. I would say that, you know, the emotions of, of happiness, of, of friendship, confidence are transmitted from this image. The model's playful poses, happy expressions and the bold pink background are captivating, increasing the likelihood that audiences will engage with this advertisement, absorbing its content. In a similar way to the other models, Harlow wears trendy black leather clothes, appearing carefree with her arms around the person next to her. Harlow is very much depicted as part of the group, part of the gang. Using a relatable image, a snapshot of a group of friends, one of whom happens to be disabled, the advertisement uses um, the model's facial expressions and body language, so we might describe this as paralanguage, messages that are communicated um, through uh, body language, expressions, uh, visual symbols, as opposed to written or spoken content. Um, in order to provoke a deeper, more emotive sense of connection with the audience. So the idea is Diesel's advertisement is more likely to leave a lasting impression on an audience. Now, I would argue that while more in-depth, comprehensive and multifaceted representations of disability are found in literature, television, film and radio, they don't match advertising in capturing the attention of masses of people. Advertisements are unmatched in their ability to pervade people's lives, grabbing their attention, and despite their preference for short, snappy taglines and fast-moving scenes, advertising has a unique power for leaving lasting impressions. So I remember years ago when I was conducting some research with disabled women and asking them about representations of disability and gender in advertising, a disabled woman said to me, um, you know, th there's only so much I can take away from an advertisement. Advertisements can't really capture the complexity of disability in the same way that a novel might or a television programme might or a film might. 
And while I do think that's a really valid and interesting point to make, I would argue that even though they can be uh, sensationalized, dramatized, um, attention grabbing, the reality is that advertisements are going to be are going to offer the portrayals of disability that most people across the world will be exposed to because of the very nature of advertising. So I'm not suggesting that Diesel's advertisement is groundbreaking. I've literally included this advertisement um, to make a wider point about the nature of advertising and how it is effective. Um, I don't even believe that it offers a great representation of disability necessarily. As almost always is the case, as Paul Dark pointed out, the advertisement features a disabled model who exemplifies traditional, narrowly defined beauty ideals. Winnie Harlow is thin, has long flowing hair, wears high stiletto heels and looks ultra confident. Also, the solely visual nature of these advertisements, sorry, of this advertisement creates accessibility barriers for people who have visual impairments. However, the key point that I am making is that advertising is a really creative and impactful tool for communicating messages to vast amounts of people. Unlike lengthy, comprehensive messages and passages of information, found in leaflets and books, advertisements primarily aim to captivate and persuade audiences, meaning that the messages that they communicate are less likely to be ignored or disputed. So I hope this workshop will deepen your appreciation of the role that advertisements can play in promoting disability activism while bringing attention to advertising strategies that maximize the impact of activist messages. Okay, so I have another um, question for you all. I'd like to pause and ask you to think about which advertisements, and, and, and these could be advertisements that have cropped up recently in newspapers, on the television, on billboards, or they could be advertisements that you remember from decades ago. Um, which advertisements have you found most memorable? Which ones have stayed in your mind and why? So why do you think these advertisements have particularly um, stuck in your mind? What messages did you take away from these advertisements? So if you've got any examples of advertisements that have left an impression on you, please do let me know. Let's see Paul with his hand up. I would say, uh, the impression is more that it's in it, not that I particularly like it or enjoy it. And it's the two primary ones. T-Mobile used to use a lot of disabled people in their adverts. T-Mobile? Um, T-Mobile. Oh. And again, T-Mobile don't exist anymore. So it was a couple of years ago. They've now become something else. So if you look up T-Mobile adverts, you can probably go on YouTube. Then the other one, of course, is the Maltesers one, which has had a number of disabled people in it. Uh, as a kind of, kind of conversation piece, trying to through the dialogue challenge conventional stereotypes as well. Uh, so it, it, it's those those two in particular, I would say. Yeah, I think Maltesers did um a look on the light side campaign, didn't they? And um and and yeah, had representations of a woman using a wheelchair, um, some people using sign language. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did I see that your hand was up? Yes, it was, but now that I'm thinking, does it have to do with a person with a disability? Because I've tried to have a representation of disability advertising here at home in Uganda, but it hasn't been that fruitful. <laughs> um, but um, one that stands out for me here in Uganda is long ago, it was an advert about uh, cross generational relationships. Then I was at university and uh, it hit home for me. It hit home for me because it was educational and it was um, it was speaking to that time in my life whereby um, 
young girls are prone to get into cross-generational relationships for financial for financial purposes and security. So I could relate to that back then. So that is the one that stuck out for me. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Shamim. Um, you, for, for some reason, the audio was a little bit muffled for me. Um, Catalin or Dan, did you capture the the advert that Shamim was was referring to there? I didn't, but I think it was centered on education, wasn't it? If I understood correctly. And did, uh, yeah, and romance. Did I hear something about a relationship as well? Shamim, was it about education and romance? Yes, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. No, it's okay. No problem. Yeah, it was it was definitely about relationship. I was a teenager to be there, and um, an advert came out about cross generational relationship. That time in university in my life because those that when we were getting engaged, getting involved in cross generational relationships, like cross generational, yeah, for financial purposes. I could uh -huh. relate to that in that period of time because I was a young girl starting out at university and you're exposed to all these financial issues and you need support if you do so. That's when I related to it so much. Right, okay. So so I could hear um thanks for giving such an um, you know, a considered response. Um, Shamine, I, I really appreciate it. So you, I could hear that you were saying it represents generational relationships and you mentioned issues around finance as well. Uh, they're really important points because, you know, one of the key roles of, of advertising is to reflect um, what goes on in society. The reason that advertising um, is so popular and such a popular strategy for brands and organizations to reach out to people is because it reflects scenarios, events that most people um, would recognize and are familiar to a lot of people. And this is why, you know, a great deal of disability activists for many years have um, raised um, raised alarms about advertising's total exclusion of disabled people prior to the 1980s, because if advertising is a tool for reflecting society as we know it, and then it's absolutely not fair or, or right in any way for disabled people to be wiped out from those representations. Catalin? We have here a comment from Oliver in the chat, and he's, uh, he's saying that um, a lot of advertising uses seen or physical disabilities and not unseen or hidden disabilities because it's, I guess, easier to communicate and to visualize in, in, in an image rather than having a narrative around hidden disabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a very good point. Did you say, um, so the name, um, Oliver, I'd really agree. So traditionally, in past decades, advertisers have tended to overwhelmingly use people who um, who use wheelchairs or people who um, maybe use sign language because, as you say, they're easily recognisable symbols of disability. And this still happens today. You know, we do tend to, um, in terms of disability, I wouldn't say this fair representation. Um, people who have physical impairments are most likely to be featured in advertisements. And actually, in, in my um, forthcoming book, Advertising Disability, in the conclusion, this is one thing that I urge advertisers to think about. You know, when we think about advertising now in 2024, some advertisements resemble mini films, okay? There's so much attention paid to grabbing the audience's emotions, to sucking the audience in. There's no longer excuses for only featuring disabled people who are instantly recognizable. You know, I think um, portrayal of mental health issues of chronic illnesses could be handled very effectively in television advertising or social media advertising, for example. Um, we've got, oh, 
I think I've just taken us back a couple of slides. So um, Dan has said, not about disability particularly, but I probably watch more ads on YouTube than any other platform these days. So the ones that stand out for me are those that break the conventions of advertising. Yeah, definitely. Those in humour, no matter what product, what the product, I will skip from them unless they are different or funny. Um, speaking of wiping out disabled people in advertising, it made me think of radio advertising, which I do consume a fair bit of. I couldn't think of any example of disability in radio advertising. Yeah, um, I, I think as well. So, so it's I don't know how much time I'll have to talk about controversial strategies. To, actually, I do. I, 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 I will talk to you about shock advertising. Um, and like Dan said, when when you produce advertisements, that shock or create some sort of controversy or debate, they are likely to leave an imprint on people's minds. Um, George has said, I see in several cases, people with disabilities are not used much in, co in commercial advertising, are we not presentable? Um, and Shamin agrees, yes, in Uganda, people with disabilities are not used in commercial advertising. Um, it's interesting because you know, I would say that um, prior to the 1980s in the UK context, uh, for example, disabled people were not included in commercial advertisements whatsoever. You would only have disabled people represented in pharmaceutical advertisements, charity advertisements, advertisements for rehabilitation products. In the UK, I would say that we are seeing a lot more portrayals of disability in um, commercial adverts, but it's really interesting to hear international perspectives on that, Catalin. Yes, yeah, sorry, me again. I, I had this, uh, suddenly this flash, this uh, flashback to uh, an Ikea ad uh, some years ago, which showed two people um, who were using sign language to talk about furniture and then build the furniture. That made me really think about how advertising sometimes uses disability in a more incidental way where it's not part of the narrative or it's not focused as a narrative or kind of obstacle to overcome and thus evoking stereotypes. Um, and sometimes it's very much part of the narrative and it builds on that, like in the Paralympics, uh, Channel 4's Paralympics. So I think that's an interesting distinction of whether it's incidental in advertising or whether it's really focused on disability in a narrative uh, means. Definitely. That's a really great point. A lot of disability studies scholars argue that slice of life portrayals, so like the one you just mentioned, people building IKEA furniture and just happening to communicate via sign language. A lot of people in disability studies argue that that's the way forward. And, and I do agree. I think those type of portrayals are really important. Um, however, from speaking to you know lots of disabled people over the years in regards to advertising, um, some people argue that you really do need more provocative trails that grab people's attention or maybe a bit risky. Um, I remember one disabled woman I was talking to said that you know some people just won't even take notice of the slice of life everyday portrayals in order to really. Um, grab some people's attention and make them think differently. You do need the more provocative approaches. Um, I can see a message from Francis. People with disabilities aren't included in commercial adverts in Uganda and calls for sensitizing all stakeholders that people with disabilities are also normal and good for advertising. Okay, it's really interesting to hear perspectives from Uganda and you know, perspectives from um, from where people are based. So thank you very much for those comments. Um, if, I, if I can move on slightly building on the discussion, I'd argue that advertising is a really powerful tool for promoting disability activism and social change. While advertisements have always reached masses of people via television, radio and news media, since the advent of the internet and social media, advertising that is particularly emotive, shocking, funny or bold has the potential to go viral. 
So advertisements are really effective tools for mass communication because they can, especially via social media, reach billions of people across the globe. In 2022, alongside Professor Beth Haller, whose work on disability and advertising is, is really foundational, I guest edited a special issue of the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. And, and remember that journal title because I will mention it again at the end of my presentation. And this special issue was titled Advertising and Diversity, the Framing of Disability in Promotional Spaces. An article by Shilpa Anand was published as part of our special issue explores advertising as activism. And Anand's article focused on um, activism, promoting Kashmiri human rights um, campaigns. As noted by Shilpa Anand, human rights and social justice activists are increasingly using social media to circulate digital advertisements that they create. In Anand's words, um, quote, in quotes, such circulation has built solidarities across nation state borders and created communities of effect amongst people who are struggling, close quotes. So in relation to social media, and if you are thinking about promoting your messages via um, advertisements that you disseminate across social media, it's also useful to consider if in doing this, you might want to work with disabled social media influencers. Brands are increasingly partnering with social media influencers who paid who feature paid product endorsements, review products and services via their social media channels. Social media marketing is particularly popular with younger generations who may follow popular social media influences anyway. So social medias, I'm thinking about people who are kind of the latest generation of celebrity, people who are ordinary people, like you and I. Um, however, they post insights from their life um, across social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and in doing so, they gain huge followings. That's how I describe social media influences. Um, so often younger generations um, perceive that social media influences um, and the messages that they promote are more real and trustworthy worthy than traditional advertisements that you would find on television, um, in magazines or newspapers. So working with disabled influencers who promote activist messages via their social media to their followers can be a really fast and effective way. And in some instances, low cost. Say if you work with a social media influencer who you know charges a very reasonable rate to promote um, your messages or your campaigns, or, or some disabled social media influencers, if they also identify as activists, may not. Um, expect any any uh, charge whatsoever. So this approach um, in listing social me disabled social me media influences to promote your messages across social media can be very effective um, as the things that they do and say certainly do capture attention. However, a word of caution that I'd share is that social media influences in general tend to be very concerned with making the content that they produce. So when thinking about their posts on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, as appealing as possible to vast numbers of people, as making sure that the things that they, as well as making sure that the things they do and say will gain maximum exposure. So um, if you are working with disabled social media influencers, because they also need to think about the content on their channel being popular and desired by lots of people, there is a risk that activist messages can be distorted in that process. 
Advertisements are both persuasive and educational. Although we are often, when we think about advertising, we tend to think about glossy commercial advertisements for high profile brands. However, the term advertising refers to a very broad process of simply drawing attention to products, services and information. Advertisements are used for a broad spectrum of reasons, from promoting brands and attracting consumers, to also raising attention of charitable, uh, raising awareness of charitable causes and societal issues. As research by Lise et al suggests, advertising is not just a business ploy um, that's undertaken in order to sell products, Advertising is a fundamental aspect of contemporary culture that has unsurpassed communicative powers. So the key message here is when we are talking about advertising, I'm really not just talking about those advertisements for profit driven brands. You know, remember that disability activist organisations, adv advocacy groups, charities, also use advertising to get across their messages to wide audiences, to the public. However, as well as being a powerful tool, potentially for promoting social change, advertising can also reinforce the marginalization of disability in society. While advertisements have the potential to positively impact the ways in which lots of people perceive disability, advertisements have historically promoted ignorant attitudes and disabling stereotypes. As I've mentioned before briefly, until the 1980s, portrayals of disabled people were completely excluded from commercial advertisements. So I'm thinking about advertisements for um, fashion companies, for beauty companies, for um, department stores, for supermarkets. Um, disabled people did not feature at all in these ads prior to the 1980s. Depicting people with impairments and mental health issues as pitiable, as pitiable outcasts whose lives depend on charitable medical interventions, advertising prior to the 1980s undermined the disabled people's movement's emphasis on radically changing societal attitudes. In complete contrast, to disability activists demands for equality and challenges to societal barriers. These advertisements made it seem as though above all else, disabled people are desperately seeking cures in quotations. And hopefully you can hear the sarcasm in my voice as I say that. Okay, so another um, pause for group discussion. First of all, I'd like to ask you, in your opinion, what are the main ways that advertising has impacted how society treats disabled people? So what do you think are some of the main ways in which adverts have um, influenced societal attitudes, practices towards disability? And then my second question, so there's two to keep in mind. Given your experiences and what you already know about advertising, do you have any concerns about using advertisements as a tool to promote disability activism? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that I think advertising can be a really great way of promoting disability activism, but do you have any concerns or different opinions on that matter? Thanks. I, I would say I have big concerns in the sense that much like cinema and most media, inclusion in itself makes very little difference if it reinforces the negativity about difference but just reinforces the notion of 
sameness. And I think that's a big problem in all media representation. So for example, the mainstream media's desire to mainstream disability mm -hmm. achieved nothing in comparison to ghetto television, which actually I would argue achieved mm -hmm. much more, which was disabled people making programs about disability for disabled people. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, it just reinforces the oppression if they're just disabled versions of of the what we would normally see, i.e. attractive, thin people that you tend to get in adverts or attractive, thin, uh, visually impaired or hard of hearing people. And I, and I think that's a serious problem uh, that's worth thinking about. No, I, I'd agree with you. I, I, and that's one thing that I, I, I argue in my research that if we were to solely think about the statistics on portrayals of disability in advertising, for example, in the UK, statistics might suggest that we've made loads of progress because disabled people are far more visible in adverts. But um, the thing is, though the, the volume of representations um, doesn't necessarily um, indicate social change because as you say the tendency is to have people who appear to be non-disabled apart from the fact that they have a prosthetic limb or you know they, they're using a wheelchair however do you not think that when we're moving towards change I kind of think that tokenism always comes before more radical changes do you not think that like we might have this period of tokenism and then move on to, to, to better representations? My personal view would be that's a nice idea, but I don't think it, it ever really delivers. I think that's true of uh, race, gender, sexuality. Mm -hmm. And one needs to look at the position in society of those groups. And I think... Uh, particularly on the issue of, say, race, I'd recommend there's a new film out called American Fiction about race, which I think is is really rather very good, uh, that's linked to this, and I would I would watch it. It's called American Fiction. Uh, it's very good. I have issues with it, but I think it's one of the better films I've seen recently, which which explores this very notion of, of kind of like the positive image over the negative image through tokenism. But I would say... Since, say, the 2012 Paralympics and how that was seen as a, as a kind of seminal moment or a transformative moment, disabled people in most countries, Britain particularly, are getting to be in a worse position than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't delivered. Uh, in a way that you would have expected it to or have hoped it to do. You know, more people live in poverty, more children are segregated, all, all of those issues, the, the benefit system, the, the public negation of the value of disabled people by politicians has failed to, to make that significant change. So just on the basis of uh, what you would have thought as, as an incredible decade of progression from 2012 has actually turned into a decade of real deterioration and negation of the value of disabled people in society, except, and I think I used to write about the good cripple and the bad cripple, uh, the deserving oh. and the undeserving. Oh. And, and I think often that tokenism merely reinforces that and doesn't change anything structurally it has the potential to and I'm, I'm not denying what you're saying but i think i would argue the evidence is that it hasn't and, and even just because disabled people may be making it themselves now and again i'd recommend american fiction in relation to exploring this as a kind of issue of race but actually if you just rep use disabled people instead of of, of, of black people in, in a film like American Fiction, uh, I think it, it's clearer to see. So it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Thank you very much. I will definitely watch American Fiction. Thank you, Paul. Um, just one point yeah. I'll pick up on there that... Sorry, Catalin. Sorry, Ella, we had a hands up from Banya as well. 
Yeah, so I'll I'll just shortly respond and then I'll I'll go to um, Banya's question. Um, what one thing that's increasingly prevalent now um, is a very popular trend in advertising are pro diversity or you know love your body, love yourself advertising, where advertisements mostly for um, beauty and fashion companies will implore often they're targeted towards women, women who, you know, of all different shapes, sizes, skin colors, ages, to like love their bodies. And, and sometimes disabled women are featured in these campaigns as well. And I would say, Paul, picking up on some of the issues that you mentioned, um, this is something I really do feel with those advertisements. You know, they make me very angry and they make a lot of disabled people angry because it's all very well to be told in an advertisement to love yourself and love your body. But when you're in a society that constantly belittles you, undermines your self-esteem, how, you know, what chances do we actually have to build positive self-esteem and to love our bodies? Um, so thank you. Banya, did you have a question or a comment as well? I don't know whether Banya actually gave their comment on the chat because I can see. Um, so Banya has said ads dismantle poor and negative um, attitudes towards persons with disabilities. Ads promote inclusion. Ah, so it seems like you're very much in favour of advertising as a, as a tool for change. Yeah, can you hear me? This is Banya. Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yeah. Oh, okay, hi. So uh, what I wanted to say, you, you mentioned it uh, earlier uh, uh, before I spoke, um, uh, the fact that persons with disabilities are not much, the first one is um, about self-esteem that you mm -hmm. just Your mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yeah, self-esteem that you just and, and there doesn't come to look for, for people. It, it, they use the people that are readily available. Yeah. And it just so happens that persons with disabilities are not readily available to feature mm. in commercial advertisement. That's one. Two, uh, in the areas where persons with disabilities feature in uh, commercial advertisement, mm. what I have observed in the film industry, uh, uh, there is a film featuring a person with disability and when it is advertised and then watch it live or or watch it on YouTube because they want to see how a person with disability uh, acts in the film or in the mm. movie and, and that's what pulls people to 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 commercial advertising but usually that's what you mentioned um, mostly in Africa uh, mm -hmm. for example women with disabilities have that low self and, and you well know that uh, in uh, maybe 80 or 70% of advertisements, commercial mm -hmm. advertisements feature women. Um, bas and basically because of beauty and they love fashion and all that. So women with disabilities have uh, that much, been left so much behind than yeah. men. And that's why they don't feature a lot in commercial advertisement. So there are several reasons why uh, people with disabilities are not into commercial advertisement and are not Absolutely. used for advertisement and and, and that, yeah. But uh, definitely, I think if persons with disabilities were readily available, then the commercial industry, the advertisement industry would be relevant, would be ready to use them if they were available. Mm, okay, so so there's two key points I've picked up from what you've said. Um, thanks very much for that and for those insights. So one, whenever we think about representation of disability in advertising, film, television, wherever, like the point that you're raising, how I perceive it, is that not only do we think about how they are being represented, but we need to very much focus on what happens behind the scenes as well. So, you know, if, if you're making the point that, um, you, you know, you don't really see disabled people in commercial ads, well, why might that be? 
um, you know, that, I mean, that, that there are things like in, in recent years, um, talent agencies that specifically represent disabled people have emerged. You know, there's some problematics of that. Um, but also some people have said, you know, that's a sign that, that change is happening. Um, the second point um, makes me think about intersectionality. And you were saying about how you know, disabled women might experience some extra barriers in relation to gender as well as disability. And I think intersectionality is a really important point when we think about portrayals of disability and advertising, because although, sorry, I keep on referring to the UK, it's just that, you know, I've, I've only ever lived in the, the, the UK all my life. So it's it's the context I'm most familiar with. In the UK, you know, we, we do have a lot more disabled people in commercial adverts now, but overwhelmingly um, they are white disabled people. Um, they, to be honest, there tends to be kind of an equal representation of, of men and, and disabled women. Um, so, but they, they overwhelmingly, I would say that, that there is the representation of white disabled people, younger disabled people. You wouldn't really find many older disabled people portrayed in advertisements. Um, so thanks for those thought points, Banya. Um, Cosmos has their hand up. Yeah, thank you uh, for this meeting. Uh, I see is that uh, when we are talking much about the uh, advertisement, yeah, about the social change or any social activities, we are always thinking why people with disabilities are not in. But uh, through my experience, the way I see, it is not why are they not in, but uh, what makes them not to be in. Mm. For example, with the few experiences that, uh, with my own experience that uh, I have done in Tanzania, where I started the ICT skills for people with visual impairment and blind people, where I tried to make sure that uh, uh, people who are blind, the teacher is also blind. Right, okay. And what happened is that uh, I started this, uh, start, uh, this experience, this um, practices in 2011. By 2016, I had uh, one person become ad became advertised more globally as because he became the winner of the Commonwealth of Learning Award, which oh, wow. he, he is already in the internet throughout. And why that came out, it is this person lost sight at the age of 15, and then, um, and then he became totally blind. And then he, he managed to get an opportunity to work with me at the Open University of Tanzania as the teacher. And then he changed from the chemical engineer to learning of the social science studies. Mm -hmm. And he managed to complete master's online learning, a number of online learning courses, and a number of other things. Okay. And this, what does it tell? It tells that uh, every time when we are talking about disability, the focus is uh, why are they not represented? Mm -hmm. Which, uh, of course, it is good to ask why are they not represented, mm -hmm. but it is important, even more better, to learn what makes them to be not in mm -hmm. and what can we do so that they come in. This is the area that I'm um, I'm really focusing. But yeah. I tried for the blind, and now the United Republic of Tanzania uh, managed to employ a blind person as the accountant in the means of health, which indicates that once you give them opportunity uh -huh. uh, to do the things they want, mm -hmm. it is easier for them to change. And okay. I have another example of one where a person oh, who... So, so, sorry, Cosmas, can I just um, relate to some of the comments because there are they are commenting on exactly what you said. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the comments is exactly what you said, to have more inclusion behind the camera and make sure that there are more script writers, media uh, professionals, cinematographers, commissioning editors um, that are people with disabilities. And that's not currently the case. And I think that's a really important point that it's not just about actors and talents and talent agencies. It's also about the creators, content creators, not uh, not having disabilities and that's why um 
we have these gatekeepers. And I know that several filmmaker friends of mine who, who work in this area, they are not disabled and they have a kind of anxiety or apprehension to represent disability because they don't know how to and they rather rely on other people to do it. So I think that's yeah. a big issue. Uh, that's uh, thank you cosmos and thank you catalin for picking up on the comments in the chat that is a key issue um you know if, if non-disabled people are dominating the advertising industry then then there will be these concerns about how do we get it right you know as though disability is some extra special category rather than an aspect of identity and um, thanks for those comments i'm going to move on to my next slide to think a bit about charity advertising in particular Charity advertising has historically disregarded disability activist calls for us to piss on pity, to take one of the most famous slogans from the disabled people's movement. As foundational disability studies scholar and activist Paul Longmore suggests, while non-disabled people who donate to charities enjoy a sense of self-satisfaction and pride, this is at the expense of disabled people being, repre being represented as, in quotes, hopeless, helpless and futureless, taking attention away from their human rights. Over the decades, the charity advertising industry has had disastrous impacts on public perceptions of disability, giving the impression that the best thing non-disabled can, people can do is treat disabled people with sympathy. So as I'm sure that we're all aware, um, charity advertising um, you know, is, is infamous in disability studies and disability activist circles. So this slide features a small variety of past and present charity advertisements. And one of the points I'm making is that over the decades, little has changed when it comes to depictions of disability in charity ads. So the first image is produced by the Muscular Dystrophy Group in the UK, and it is a grayscale image of a boy sitting in a wheelchair in the middle of a field with the outskirts of a small town noticeable in the far background. Using a guilt tripping approach, the tagline appears to be handwritten and it says, he'd love to walk away from this poster too. While smaller text at the bottom of the advert says, help us find the cure. Completely ignoring the resentment and anger disabled people feel when it is presumed that they are waiting helplessly for non-disabled saviours, in quotes, the advertisement implies that disabled people's chances of happiness are in the hands of the non-disabled audience. The advertisement on the right side of this slide features an illustration of a man holding a shotgun with one hand, while his head has been replaced by a stag's head. Produced for the Multiple Sclerosis Society New Zealand, the advertisement creates a sense of doom and fear surrounding multiple sclerosis, which is emphasised by the message, multiple sclerosis turns your brain and body against one another. Using a dramatic metaphor to capture the audience's, interest, the audience's interest and increase the likelihood that people will donate to the, the MS group, um, the advertisement actually undermines the self-advocacy of people who have MS, who call for changes to societal attitudes, namely that MS is not a life-limiting tragedy. So, Charity advertisements often claim and present themselves as speaking on behalf of disabled people. But actually, they're detracting attention and distorting the very messages that disabled people want to put out there. Meanwhile, although the smaller advertisement, which is in the middle of my slide, which has been produced by the, for the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children, this advert appears to take a more optimistic approach. It features various toys and a child's teddy. It uses bright, engaging colours. So there's a blue background and the teddy is bright yellow. The main focus of the advert is a teddy bear who does not have any eyes or ears. Using a direct personal appeal, we need your help. 
The advertisement plays with the audience's emotions, suggesting that disabled children they support could enjoy happy, normal childhoods if they weren't supposedly afflicted by visual and hearing impairments. So in other words, charity advertisements continue to promote the tragedy steeped narratives of disability that so many disabled people and activists deeply resent. Now moving on to shock advertising, the charity advertising industry is beginning to realize that audiences are becoming increasingly skeptical of manipulative, heartstring tugging appeals. Audiences are finding it difficult to empathize with tragic images that are far removed from their own lives. In recent years, some charity advertising campaigns do appear to be listening to some extent to disabled activist criticisms of pity appeals. And these charities have started slowly but surely to move towards producing more empowering representations of disabled people. Um, so for instance, some charities have started to produce advertisements that aim to shock and provide thought-provoking thought insights into the discrimination that's faced by disabled people. So for example, in 2016, the UK-based charity for people who have learning disabilities, MENCAP, launched their provocative campaign, Here I Am, which features various people who have learning disabilities. I've included two screenshots from a television advert produced as part of MENCAP's Here I Am campaign on my slide. So um, these images feature DJ Casey Dude, who is a young man who has Down syndrome. And although it's not visible in the images um, because they're close up images of his face, he's a young man with Down syndrome who's wearing a hoodie with his hood up. Um, he is audio mixing, so he is DJing in this TV advertisement. While the advertisement is playing, you can hear a voiceover. And this is an advertisement if you did want to um, watch it on YouTube. If you just looked up Mencap DJ Casey Dude, here I am, you would find it. Um, while the advertisement is playing, there is a voiceover who is described as a leading academic 1968. And the voiceover says, there is no reason to feel guilty about putting a Down syndrome child away. True guilt only arises from an offence against a person and Downs is not a person, end quote. However, rather than creating a pity appeal, this charity advertisement aims to provide a shocking insight into cruel and hostile attitudes towards people with Down syndrome. Um, the rest of the advertisement shows DJ Casey Dude, who is a man with Down syndrome, cutting the audio. To, so it says Downs is a person, while Here I Am confronts the audience in bold text across the middle of the screen. Resisting charity advertising's tendency to portray disabled people as objects of pity, DJ Casey Dude, and he's shown um, in presumably in a studio, um, there are people in front dancing as he DJs for them. He's uh, re represented as cool and talented while he promotes an empowering counter narrative of Down syndrome. In other words, the advertisement is more activist than pity inspired as it depicts a disabled person's resistance to prejudice. Now to move on, um, I want to think a bit about how shock advertising, so advertising that aims to shock audiences, is used by disabled people's organisations. So disabled people's organisations create shocking advertisements in order to educate people about disabling barriers. Given that individuals tend to only recall 11% of advertisements they come into contact with each day, as noted in research by Lee et al. Messages and images that spark alarm, disturbance and outrage make advertising content much more memorable. 
Advertisements for disabled people's organisations are often designed to trigger audiences into rethinking their mindsets and their perceptions about disability. Um, advertisements that aim to shock audiences into changing their perceptions can also go viral on social media, meaning that shock advertising, advertisements that shock, can be a really effective way of sharing your messages with wide audiences. The strategy of using images to tell short stories and to shock people is exemplified in an advertising campaign launched by the Disabled People's Association Singapore in 2016. So um, the Disabled People's Association is an adv advocacy group um, for disabled people in Singapore and this advertising campaign aim to raise awareness of public environmental barriers, particularly in transport that disabled people face. So I featured one of their print advertisements on my slide and the advertisement is completely composed of a photograph that shows a man who uses a wheelchair unable to get into a crowded lift. Positioned as a bystander, so it's almost as though the audience is someone standing close by who's observing this situation. Um, the audience observes the scene from behind the man. And so the man using the wheelchair is positioned at the forefront of the image and his back faces the camera. So we see the scene, we see the crowded lift as though it's from his point of view. So there's a a, a message, a bright yellow capitalised message, which relays the moral of the image. To you, it's the easy way. To him, it's the only way. The advertisement aims to cause feelings of discomfort for non-disabled people who have been complicit, who have not called out similar situations. The, advertising, um, the advertisement frames the message to him, it's the, to you, it's the easy way, to him, it's the only way, in a very direct way, as though they're directly speaking to the audience. The image and provocative message encourage individuals to make mental shortcuts, realising that they can change their attitudes and challenge ableism, or they can continue simply to be, pi pi pa to be passive bystanders and not say anything. So what I wanted to ask you, if say if you were um, creating an advertisement to raise awareness of barriers that disabled people face, are there any particular barriers that you'd want to draw attention to? Do you think you might use similar techniques to draw attention to these barriers? So Cosmos has just said, we need to create opportunities that increase access to skills training that would make people with disabilities unlock their abilities. I totally agree with you. And in particular, if, if we do want better representation of disability in advertising, we will need more disabled advertising professionals. And so they need to be supported in order to gain those positions. Totally agree. Cosmos, do you have your hand up as well? Yeah. Maybe I can add more from what I said earlier. What I see it is that um, uh, always if we say we are going to create advertisement for people with disabilities, I am always like uh, not in that side, but uh, I'm the side of how best can we make people with disabilities themselves create content? Because once they start creating content, they advertise for themselves. It will be much easier. I remember in 2017, we started a collaboration with the Sintef with, with the idea of creating a testing tool for hearing loss. And the idea was for children. And then I just said, because we are looking for children, then let us make children participate fully in the development of the tool. 
What happens is that uh, the tool has been accepted by children and the adults and everyone because they said they want a game. Mm -hmm. and therefore, we created a tool which is a game based so that uh, one can, can, can test hearing through that way. And yeah. for in my side, as I say, increase the opportunity for skills training. If we try our best and create basic causes on advertising, and then those causes be geared at empowering people with disabilities for them to make some advertisements. I think that one will might be a much a bigger milestone than always thinking because for me i always say i am not disabled therefore it is very difficult for me to say i will teach ict a person who is blind because i don't have the experience of blindness okay. and similarly as we don't have the experience of being disabled as of now can't we try to find means and ways to make people with disabilities come forward and help us what should they want to be advertised? For example, I have a, a, a blind student person who didn't complete even basic education, but he wanted to work in the advertisement industry. And he has it always creates things that when you hear, you just feel that this has been created by a person with disability. And the feeling is even more bigger, more serious than if I created myself for a person with a disability. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. No, I do. Thank you, Cosmos. And uh, you're raising a very important point that, you know, if we do want to affect change, um, small tokenistic um, changes won't cut it. Um, and I think that's a really important point. The advertising industry is finally realising that images of disabled people, disabled actors, models need to be in advertisements. But I really think that they're that they're not creating opportunities for disabled people to be trained as advertising professionals or, you know, their working environment may well put um, disabled advertising professionals off if they're inaccessible. So I totally agree, you know, um, we need more than tokenistic um, offers of inclusion. I think that's a really important point. And actually, my, my so my following slide, um, build really nicely on your point cosmos that you know we we need to we need disabled people themselves directly involved in the process of creating adverts so uh, this slide is about getting it wrong and um there's screenshots of images from um, an advertising a tv advertising campaign that was created by um disability charity scope which is based in the uk and um, this campaign was called End the Awkward. So the screenshots I've included, um, on the left side, there's a man who is in, you know, a, a work, he looks like he's dressed for work. Um, he's got a shirt and a tie and he, one of his arm, um, it, so his, his arm is amputated on one side. And there's a message that says two thirds of people say they worry about talking about disability in front of a disabled person. Hashtag end the awkward. And then the other image um, has a man who also looks like he's dressed for work in a um, in a shirt. And he doesn't appear to be disabled, but he's bending down in quite a patronizing way. And the message says the awkward. I bent down to a wheelchair user, how what, question mark, situation. And the reason I've included this is, is this TV advertising campaign, which focused on um, helping non-disabled people feel less awkward around disability. This advertising campaign received lots of praise from audiences and the media in the UK. However, disability activists such as Hilton pointed out, with disability hate crime on the increase, the closure of the independent living fund, the bedroom tax, the assisted dying bill, the cumulative effects of cuts on disabled people and the vilification of disabled people in the right wing press. Why is scope still banging on about end the awkward? So in other words, disabled activists said, 
you've created a television ad ad advertising campaign, which is, you know, obviously a lot of money has gone into this and you choose to focus on helping non-disabled people feel less awkward. What about all these really pressing and barriers that are affecting people's day-to-day -day lives? Okay, why focus on awkward attitudes when you've got much, there's a, a phrase that I might use, bigger fish to fry. So in other words, um, more serious, more disastrous barriers to contend with. So, as I said, this leads on from Cosmos's point, because when you have, I mean, I, I, to be very honest with you, I, I don't know exactly who was involved in the production of this advertising campaign. However, I would be surprised if there were many disabled people involved, because um, many would argue that, that, that this gets it wrong. In other words, um, this TV advertising campaign appears to advocate for disabled people, yet sidelines the issues that matter most to disabled people. So finally then, creating advertisements that are impactful. I wanted to share with you some um, tips, some practical tips, if you wanted to think about creating your own advertisements or promoting your messages through adverts. So first one, diversity is key. As we've been saying that it does seem that disabled people are more likely to be portrayed in advertising now. However, people with dwarfism, people who have learning disabilities, cognitive impairments, chronic illnesses, what people may describe as visible, visible impairments are far less noticeable in advertising. So that's a really important point, not to simply go down the route of only featuring people who are immediately recognisable as disabled. I'd also argue that when we consider accessibility, we actually enhance advertising content. So when you, when you include an image or a message in advertising, the audience could interpret that image or message in very many different ways. However, if you include accessibility features such as a voiceover that describes visual content or closed captioning, it's more likely that the audience will have an opportunity to understand the message that you're trying to convey. It's another way for people to absorb that content. I'd also recommend um, that you use social media to your advantage. So you might consider catchy hashtags that you can use alongside advertisements and also encourage other disability advocacy and activist networks to reshare any adverts, any messages that you create. Create maximum impact through clear and concise messages. So remember that when people are engaging with advertisements, um, that engagement tends to be very brief, hence why advertisers favour catchy, easily noticeable taglines. And also, you know, if you are aiming for adverts you create to, to reach international audiences, brief, concise messages are better because they can be more easily understood and translated. And importantly, I'd really recommend approaching advertisements as an opportunity to promote counter narratives of disability. So in other words, to resist, to challenge, to call into question stereotypes, common misconceptions about disabled people. My very final slide, um, I wanted to bring attention to um, a research centre, which I'm a core member of. Oh, sorry, I've got my alarm going off there to make sure I keep in time. So I'm a member of the Centre for Culture and Disability Studies, which is a research centre. Uh, you know, as you'd imagine from the name, we particularly focus on culture, cultural representations, cultural attitudes that impact disabled people. So it would be really great, you know, if you want to reach out to us. Um, I've included a link to our website in the slides. Um, we also have a YouTube channel and um, perhaps a, a particularly easy way of keeping in touch with us is via Facebook. So if you type into Facebook, Centre for Culture and Disability Studies, you should find our page. And we post regular updates. Uh, you know, you can add, we can add you to the page. Um, also, let us know if there's anything that you'd like us to promote from your end. Um, one thing I should mention as well is that I am 
book reviews editor for the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. So this is a journal um, that very much focuses on cultural disability studies research. But if there were any, say for example, if there is a, a book relating to disability that you're really interested in writing a review of, reviews tend to be around 1,500 words, please do get in touch with me to propose it. Um, and we could feature a book review written by you in the journal. So if you do want to reach out to me, my email address, which I've included on the slide, is h-o-u-s-t-o-e at hope.ac.uk. And um, Dan, Filippo, Catalin, I'm, I'm very happy for my slides to be shared with everyone as well. And that is my presentation, um, everybody. Um, I, just as a final note, I will mention that the Research Centre, the Centre for Culture and Disability Studies, we often, um, so just yesterday, we had an engagement event. Um, you could access it via Zoom online. Um, we have a conference once every two years. Um, so so if, if you can in any way get involved with those events, that would be fantastic. As I say, just get in touch with me and I'll happily give you more information on that. Thank you so much for sharing your fantastic and very thought-provoking research uh, with us, Ella. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? We only have a few minutes, so please keep them concise. I, I was just going to say thank you. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank, thank you. Paul. Any yeah. Thank you for the nice presentation. We are so happy that we enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Francis. That's very kind of you today. Francis from Uganda, thanks very much for the presentation and thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Any other comments? Or um, maybe I... And sorry, I, I can come in and just say that, uh, Ella, thanks big. This is George. Hi, George. In terms of... Uh, uh, programming, I think this gives us uh, an area that is not yet tapped. And I think as practitioners, then how do we get um, the advertising agencies to get uh, persons or people with disabilities or people with impairment into this space? Um, a lot has been done, but the practice, I think, is still weak. And this is what we need to look at. How do we churn in more? A disability activists into the commercial um, advertising, the branding sector, so that then the myth is dispelled. Thanks for your presentation and we'll reach you up. We have the email. Yes, and I'm just going to put a name into the chat. So Josh Loebner is, um, so, so he, he recently completed his PhD in disability studies, but he is a disabled advertising professional who works for an American advertising um, agency. Um, so if, if anyone did want to, I think it's Wonderman, let me just Google the name. Um, yeah, Wonderman. I'll, I'll okay, just so add, I've included uh, the name there. Hi, right, Paul. I was just going to say one thing, kind of quite academically, is uh, is to think about how charity advertising. A lot of it is designed to replace the disability movement and activism. Mm -hmm. I think in in the in the late. 80s, 90s, I worked for a big charity and uh, we used to discuss the disabled people in it about how it was about setting the scene, both through in its PR, its appeals and everything else. And we said that in 20 years, the charities would replace the disability movement. And to some oh, yeah. extent, yeah, they've done that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, it really is um, disgraceful. Um, and, and interestingly, um, 
Well, I've in my I won't talk too much about the book, but in my book that I've got coming out in June, I've dedicated a whole chapter to charity advertising and and the various, you know, now there's there's more of a trend for these happy appeals of disabled people living their best lives thanks to charity interventions, and without a doubt. You know, a lot of charities do fantastic work. A lot of disabled people work for charities themselves. Um, but when disabled activist messages are being distorted or sidelined by charities, I think that's that's obviously the massive problem. Yeah. OK, I, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, but thank you so much, Anna, again, for your time and your presentation. And uh, it really pleasure. emphasizes it really emphasizes how important media representations are in terms of social attitudes towards disability, sure. but also the sense of self-identity for disabled people. So as, as Dan said in the chat, our next webinar will be in March and we'll um, be announcing it shortly through our channels. So thank you very much for everyone, everyone's contribution. Have a wonderful day and see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks Bye. for coming, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.